All right. Good afternoon, traders. Thanks for joining today's guest speaker webinar. Uh, be sure to use the Q&A box or the chat box to ask questions, and Will will do his best to answer them by the end of the presentation. As always, my name is Keith here with Shark Indicators. We've been in the, involved in the Ninja Trader ecosystem since 2011, providing tools like Bloodhound and Blackbird that help traders be more productive and in control of their own trade systems. We're always looking for ways to add to the trader's toolkit, and this webinar is a big part of that mission. Before I pass it off, let's take a quick look at the risk disclosure, of course. Futures, foreign currency, and options trading contain substantial risk and is not for every investor, and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Will Busby, founder of Pure Financial Academy, is an educational director and software developer. Since 2009, he has primarily focused on the development and advancements of supply and demand trading principles in the financial markets. Will displays his passion in the PFA community daily and strives to provide a fun and interactive environment for all supply and demand traders. So Will, with that, I'll pass it off to you so we can get started. All right, thank you, sir. Most appreciated. Super happy to be here as always. I hope that uh, you all had a fantastic, <clears throat> fantastic day. Give me just one second. I'm going to, um, <clears throat> I'm going to disturb all of you and I apologize in advance. <laughs> so I'm going to disturb you. Let's see if I can get, uh, give me just one second. I'm trying to get the, the background deal here done. It was supposed to work. It says it is. If not, that's okay too. Let's see, let's try that again. Let me give you the nice background. There you go, all right, cool. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna disturb you guys. I apologize in advance for uh, for having to you know, take on my video for a bit, but I, all joking aside, I always find it somewhat you know entertaining to put a, a face to the name and everything like that. So we'll get started. I'm gonna share my screen with you here in a moment. Um, kind of have a few things going on. So we'll try to make it through the presentation uh, relatively swift. And then we'll get out uh, maybe to the charts. I'm just looking at uh, at my monitor as we speak. I mean, there's always uh, some irony in the markets. Um, hopefully, you guys are seeing the same thing. <laughs> Excuse me, same thing that we are. Um, but I guess we'll find out soon. And I'll, I'll give you a little heads up as to uh, what we discussed today in the room, what we thought, uh, and then as well as maybe uh, what our ongoing thoughts are. And uh, I am going to do a follow-up session. We always try to do this when we're doing, uh, you know, events, partner events, things to that extent, uh, or trusted resources, et cetera. But uh, we do that because sometimes we're limited on time and it's very beneficial. I love doing events with, uh, with you guys with, at Shark. I mean, Shark Indicator is incredible. And so um, it's always nice to do that because, you know, there's not this extreme pressure to get it done and you know, 30 minutes or whatnot, we get to spend a little time. That being said, I want to respect all of your time. Uh, and then again, we'll do the follow up. If you want to stick around as long as you want, we'll hang out, answer questions, so on and so forth. Okay. So let's get right to it. The fun, right? Disclaimer. So trading contains substantial risk and obviously not for every investor. Uh, an investor could potentially lose all or more of their initial investment. That is most unfortunate, but very true. Risk capital is money that can be lost in uh, without jeopardizing one's financial security or lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading. And only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So um, carry on about that. Obviously, the CFTC rule and so on and so forth. So let's just get right to it. Um, again, I want to respect your time very much. So let's see if I can do this. I'm going to try. Um, uh, I'll probably stop my my you know video uh, here in just a bit. I don't want it to be distracting from the presentation, but I, you know I'm happy to keep it up. It's no no big thing there. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward. If it becomes distracting or what have you, do let me know. Let me get the chat up here. All right, very good. So I have that. Uh, as Keith mentioned moments ago, if you don't mind, and you guys are always so, uh, I really appreciate how you are so re very respectful of that, uh, of the time and so on. If you can hold your questions towards the end of the session, um, I will get directly to them. That will allow me to be more efficient with the time. If you have a pertinent question, you know, absolutely feel free to let me know, okay? And I'll, I'll do my best to 
to keep, uh, if I could do my eyes, you know, some people can, can move their eyes. If I could do that, I would. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't. So I'm always joking around with our room because, you know, I, you know, I, I know I was meant to be a comedian. It just didn't work out. You know, they would, I think uh, pretty quickly they boo me off the stage. <laughs> All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. A little bit about PFA, Pure Financial Academy. So um, we're an online community dedicated to supply and demand trading concepts. Now, supply and demand trading concept, that could be, that's all over the board. But for us, um, you know, you hear about supply and demand trading and you think, well, supply and demand strategy, right? You're thinking um, there's one way of, of doing things. To us, not even close. Supply and demand in general is pretty much what you would think of it. And so there are multiple ways to determine not only uh, you know high quality supply and demand for reversals and, and so on, but you can actually determine uh, with a pretty substantial degree of accuracy where these things are going to occur uh, in advance, which is pretty incredible because, or in my opinion, it is at least. So when we're thinking about things like that, um, you know, there's there's always the thing about being in advance, right? So we're forward looking. I mean, every trader has to be because you, you can't do anything from past. Uh, you have to do it in the present and future. So when we think about it like that, we're we're always trying to stay one step ahead of, let's call it the institutions. I don't mean that in a literal sense, but um, I mean we, we you know we're we're trying to stay way ahead of the mass public. Let's say it that way. So if we if we look at the public and we say, well, they're listening to CNBC which in itself is, is somewhat lagging. They're very good about get, uh, giving their opinions and expertise. And boy, do they do a good job at it too, right? So they keep us all on the same, you know, same path. But ultimately, th that their job is to commentate, right? So if, if we're thinking about it that way um, and we want to stay ahead of things, then we need to, number one, conceptualize who is actually turning the markets or continuing, right, for that matter, but who is moving the markets rather. Uh, and all that being said, of course, uh, as the conventional, I think, thought process would say that it's the institutions doing the most of the work, I would firmly agree with that. Um, your Goldman Sachs, your you know BOAs, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they're doing most of the legwork for us. They're moving things around. If you think about them as the shark of the ocean, right? We're like the pilot fish, and we just kind of you know we just kind of swim about, and we're you know we're trying to keep the whatever it is that the pilot fish do. I don't want to go too far into the metaphor, but they, uh, they essentially keep the shark clean and therefore they're somewhat protected. So we are in uh, that analogy or metaphor, the, uh, the pilot fish, right? And we're trying to follow them. Um, therefore they won't eat us <laughs> and swallow us whole. So uh, that's a good thing. But anyway, we're trying, to, we're trying to follow them. And by doing that, uh, we have to somewhat predetermine what they're going to do. So in essence, that kind of puts us a step ahead or we have to be it's you know it's not like uh, but ultimately we have to be ahead of what the institutions are going to do so we're thinking the same thing they are we have to get ahead of what they're going to do because in, in order to take part in what their you know their executions are we have to think the same way that they do and if, they, if the institution are the ones turning the market of course they're the ones ahead of mass public and so on and so forth okay so that's our goal um not that we always achieve it but that's our that's our goal we've been doing this for about uh it's a long time, 13 years, roughly. We do believe in the power of having others uh, there to support you on the same path as yourself. And our mission is to provide a positive and effective environment for traders and investors who wish to utilize the general supply and demand trading methods, okay? I want to share our experiences together. So let's move forward now. I hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, it, I want to uh, just kind of point out that in our very humble opinion, it really doesn't take um, a lot of complexity in the financial markets to achieve our goals. Uh, in fact, I would argue, uh, or not argue is the right word, but I would debate the opposite. I would say that in my opinion, simplicity is the key. So the more that we try to um, overthink things, uh, I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm a human, right? And so I'm constantly thinking, thinking, thinking. And the more I do that, the you know, a lot of times the decision-making becomes uh, it's not as good, right? So today we're going to simplify things and we're going to keep it literally at only two patterns and that's it. Okay. So supply and demand imbalances, demand price patterns is the first thing we're going to look at. So inside of these patterns, uh, price briefly consolidates after moving higher. So there we can see, we kind of give illustrations. You're going to see this throughout the presentation. 
um, in inside of that, they're building compression, right? So if you see it when when price kind of moves, uh, remember we're talking about demand here. So we're talking about two price patterns, as I said, one being on the demand side, one being on the supply side. Here we have the demand price patterns. Hey, Will, and, just double checking. Are you trying to share your screen? We're just seeing your face. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm boy, I am torturing you all, aren't I? Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I'm torturing you. No, I don't want to do that. Let me get you out to my to my screen. Thanks. Keith. No, nobody even noticed they were they were entranced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh no, man, I have to stare at this the whole time. No, all right, cool, man. Th hey, thank you guys. Look at you. you. You're so kind. You didn't even you didn't even give me a hard time about it. Uh, that's that's so cool, guys. All right, let me back it up just to the beginning of this slide real quick. I'm gonna. I'm going to repeat what I just said, but basically here was the slide. <laughs> this is what I was attempting to show you. So this is the supply and demand imbalances slide. It's just the, the title of to the presentation, right? So here we have the demand uh, price patterns. Now, as I was, I'm just going to be a little bit redundant and to repeat this here, but price briefly consolidates after moving higher, right? And inside of that, they're building compression. So as you can see, what I'm trying to do is illustrate that here buy orders begin to accumulate inside of the consolidation. So if I back that up a little bit, and this rectangle that you're seeing here, okay, that's the compression. That's where the accumulation of order flow is taking place. Now, when we go sideways, there is an accumulation of general order flow, meaning both to the buy and sell side. But in demand patterns, uh, you know, the, the accumulation is overweighted to the buy side. Okay. thus defining demand as opposed to supply. Continuation occurs due to the consumption of the sell orders. All right, so uh, that's how we know, right? So there's no way to know that demand exceeds supply or vice versa until you have the most important part, which is the continuation, okay? So that's this part here. We go into the, to the pattern, we consolidate, if you will, or compress, right? So as I said, it's building compression. So we do, we go ahead and compress, and then we continue. So when that continuation occurs, that is when we know it's immediate. There's no way to deny that. It just literally, um, you know, it's indicative of buyers exceeding sellers. We know that to be true because we just simply couldn't go higher uh, if, if that were not the case, okay? So we just wanted to find that. It's really not a big deal, folks. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to show you two very simple patterns. And I just want to break this down, um, and, and for illustration purposes there, I want to break it down into a very simple fashion so that we're not overthinking things. I had a wonderful conversation. I'll just share some personal stuff as we're going. Again, love doing the events with Shark Indicators because you feel that you have like two seconds to throw these tidbits in there. But I was having a wonderful conversation earlier, a very nice gentleman, seriously. I, I mean, I just thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Um, you know, but we, we were talking a lot about this simplicity, not overthinking things, um, you know, what, what, how these patterns and, and, you know, price patterns emerge and things to that extent. So the more simple and basic, in my opinion, in my opinion alone, the better. All right. So previously we were looking at demand price patterns here. We're going to look at supply. I told you there was only two, this being the second price briefly consolidates after moving lower. So the difference in the two patterns is what? One's moving up, one's moving down, right? So that it's really not uh, not a huge difference, it's just literal inverse, okay? So they're gonna build compression, same. This is the compression in which we're referring to inside of those rectangles. So in other words, guys and gals, when price in a supply pattern, when price moves down and then pauses, begins to move sideways, that is the accumulation of order flow. What tells us that it was accumulation predominantly of sell orders, is the continuation. When we get the continuation, we now know there it is, right? So it can no longer be denied. We know who won the battle and, uh, you know, we have further information that we can now depend on, all right? So the next thing I want to look at is qualifying uh, the levels in themselves. So there's a few questions that we want to ask ourselves. And I'm not going to bore you with too much on the slides. Well, I'll try to jump out to, uh, to the live charts here momentarily. And we can kind of go from there. Again, I'm looking at, you know, my my other monitor here and I just I'll, I'll show you the irony right in today. And, and um, it's frequent. It's very frequent. In fact, the the call that I was just referring to, um, very nice gentleman, as I said, we, we were conversing. I, I've had a screen share presentation. Uh, well, not a presentation, but a um, just a screen sharing session for because I wanted to introduce him to some things. 
Uh, and during that session, uh, we were on a three minute chart, whereas now I'm looking at a four hour chart, the exact same thing is happening. So some nice conversations we can have once we get there. Okay, so the first question that I wanna ask myself uh, in regards to qualifying the levels, did price depart from the consolidation fast or slow? All right, so remember the consolidation, I'm gonna give you a few different terms here. So we let's not overthink it. Um, and I don't wanna confuse anyone for sure. When I say consolidation, compression, accumulation, right? I mean, think of those as the same thing. Just remember what I'm referring to is the interior of this rectangle or these rectangles, if you will. So the first question again, let me repeat, did price depart from that consolidation fast or slow? That becomes my question, it's very important. It helps me to understand because the speed and the distance is what helps me to determine the strength versus the weakness. Fast, in other words, if we depart fast from the consolidation, that equates to strong behavior, right? Or strong uh, imbalance, order flow, if you will. And the slower that we, uh, that we depart, well, that equates to weaker uh, of an imbalance. So let, let me say that, I wanna try, try to pause there for just a second. So if I'm able to, to depart from any location and I do that abruptly, that is, uh, I'm putting the cart before the horse here, but let's, let's use the terminology decisive, okay? So uh, I, I say putting the cart before the horse because you'll see this on the, the upcoming slides. Let's ask ourselves another question. In regards to qualifying the level, how many bars closed inside of the consolidation before departing? And the, it's very important, before departing, okay? So if we look at this here, I want you to look at the red bars on the left, green bars on the right, and just notate that these are actually the same patterns that you've seen in the previous slides, and you'll recognize them now as being the compression, consolidation, accumulation, as I've mentioned before, there's a few names that I've provided uh, in regards to these, these areas here. So I just wanna ask myself, how many bars closed inside of that? That's it, right? I really only have two questions now. How did I depart from it, fast or slow? And how many bars are inside of it, okay? So the fewer bars inside of the consolidation, equates to very decisive. I told you to see these, uh, or rather hear these terms here in just a moment, right? So fewer bars equates to very decisive. Uh, many bars, so the more that you have, it, it, it's indecisive. Um, let, let me give an analogy here. So if we, if we put, uh, I don't wanna go crazy here. If we put Mike Tyson, Vander Holyfield, in a, let's say in their prime, right? Let's just go with that. So they're in their prime, both of them. We put them in a ring, and it just goes on and on and on, right? So ultimately, at the end of that, let's just say, oh boy, I really don't, I'm not skewed either way, by the way. I, I don't, I'm not going to go there with, with who I prefer to win. I don't know. But let's just say, hypothetically, that Mike Tyson ends up winning, okay? So they're both in their prime. Mike takes, takes him down. He, he wins or whatever. But it took him many, many rounds to do that. So in the analogy, um, I think we can come to the conclusion that although, you know, Mike Tyson may have won the battle, okay, if you put him in the ring again, it, it's very likely that it could go the other way, right? So it wasn't very decisive. In fact, it was pretty indecisive. There's no conclusive evidence there to say that this is the way that it would occur every time. And it's just, you know, completely overweighted in in this or on the side rather of Mike Tyson, right? Does that make sense? So that, so the longer we take, it's not good. We don't want that because what happens in that situation, um, now I'm going to leave that analogy. We're going to go to the financial markets. In that situation though, the longer it's taking, meaning the more indecisive it is, what's happening under the hood? It's fluctuating up and down. Every tick we go up or every tick we go down, it's using up orders. Well, if I want to have a substantial imbalance in the market, by definition, that means that I want something to be left over, right? So if we're in supply, let's say on this left side, and we take so long to finally depart, that means that there may not be that many orders uh, still remaining in that particular area on the sell side. Why? Well, simply because it took so long and we used most of them up. That's not what we're looking for when it comes to significant supply and demand imbalances. 
for the most part, because we want to come back to it and have the same reaction. And if we have a lot of orders still residing there, uh, you know, that stands a better chance of, of a price reversal, you know, when we, when we return. Okay. So two questions, how many bars? Uh, what was the question that we're asking here? And simply, how do we depart from said area? Okay. Now you're thinking, well, define that, right? So if we go back, I see all those bars, but um, I know, uh, and I would say, especially from the shark indicators group, uh, it's very lovely. You guys, um, again, from my experience, tend to be very objective, right? And I try to be the same way. I think it's a good thing in trading. And so you are probably, you know, you probably like the idea of a rule set, so to speak. So in that instance, how do we count the candles, right? Inside of a demand uh, zone or demand level, if you will, how exactly do we do that? If I don't have a rule set to do it, I could just count from left to right, you know? I mean, that's going to give me, obviously, I'm going to be counting, but there is a defined way that we do this. It's not... Um, uh, all, all over the board, right? So let's go, let's walk through that and then we'll we'll move forward, look at uh, supply, okay? So we'll, first and foremost, we want to determine the highest high after price moves up, all right? So there we can see we have a green candle, price is moving up. We want to adjust to each new consecutive bar's high that forms. So what happens if a new bar makes a new high? We have to adjust, right? So we're going to move on. <clears throat> that becomes our high bar. All right. So we have another bar. Uh oh, wait a minute, because this bar is red. So it has to be different, but it doesn't. Ultimately, what we're doing is we're looking, as we said, for the highest high after price moves up. As long as it continues making higher highs, we continue counting. All right. All right. So we're going to adjust to the new bar. And then we're going to count the high bar plus each bar, which fails to surpass the high bars high. So once I have that high bar, and again, remember, I, I'm always going to have a high bar, right? I mean, so let's be clear about that. But the, I don't know that that is the high bar yet. When I know that, okay, when I, in other words, when I know that this becomes the high bar and or bar number one is when bar number two forms, okay? So the, the second bar must fail to surpass the high bars high. Then I know, and I can say, okay, got it. So that be, think of a, I'm, I'm sure you're all, you know, acutely aware of what a swing is, right? So if you think about a swing, think about a one bar swing. We're moving up until we fail. I'm so sorry about these notifications, guys and girls. Tell you what, let me do this. And I'm going to, I'm going to hush it up. How about that? Okay. So we have bar one becomes the high bar. Bar number two becomes the bar in which fails to take out the high bar. All right. So we just carry on until we have the bar that surpasses number one and or the high bar, okay? So that bar is not counted. In this case, if I ask the question, how many bars do I have inside of the consolidation, which as you recall was the, I believe the previous slide, uh, in this particular instance, I would say three. Now, another example here, we have a move up. So I know, okay, great, here's my high bar. I have another high bar, uh-oh. So what I need to do is adjust to said high bar, all right? And I'm just going to keep doing that process on and on and on until we stop. Okay. So then that becomes bar number one. I now have bar number two, bar number three. And in this case, you can see we actually have some more bars, right? So I'm going to keep counting. I, I mean, it could be, uh, it, well, it could be a lot. Uh, typically, you're not going to see like some astronomical number or whatnot. But generally, let's say you see between two and 10. Okay. So in this case here, we have six. Now we have a bar that finally surpasses the high bar, ergo that bar does not get counted. If I ask myself the question, hey, how many bars are inside of the consolidation of this particular demand level? Uh, my answer would have to be six, okay? So as you can see, uh, very objective. We don't want to uh, go into something, again, part of the conversation I was having earlier today, we don't wanna go into something um, Too many decisions are a bad thing, folks, right? We have so many decisions that we have to make on a daily basis, whether it's with uh, you know, our family or friends or just general conversations, um, whether it's what you want to do on your house this week or month or 
uh, what vacation. I mean, there is countless amounts of decisions that we are making. So if I can limit that, if I can produce a rule set that makes life easier, you better believe I'm going to do that. <laughs> That's the reason we've been able to, um, as I refer to it, uh, semi-automation. Um, we have it automated, but, but the point is what I'm going to show you today and what I use on a daily basis is semi-automation. We'll look at that in a moment, okay? Bloodhound is uh, very complementary, and uh, we'll look at that as well. So how do we count the supply bars? I'm going to move through this one relatively fast here because we already know. Um, but again, we're, we're just going to invert that, right? So we're going to determine, in this case, not the highest high. We're going to determine the lowest low after price moves down. We have price there. It, and, and again, this is just illustration purposes of red candle, right? This could be a green candle. Uh, the color is irrelevant. It could be uh, to define, it, it could be, uh, you know, the open or close is irrelevant. It could be a higher bar or a, or excuse me, a higher close or lower close. But again, that, that really does not matter. I just wanted to iterate that. But for illustration purposes, I think it's, or visual purposes um, in the illustration, it's better to have the normal uh, color scheme, or at least I think it is. So here we have a down bar. We're going to go ahead and say, hey, that's my low bar, right? I'm not looking for high bar anymore. I'm looking for the low bar. So now I need to adjust to each new consecutive bar's low that forms. Okay. So again, as you can see, we're just we're just inverting the price pattern. Okay. So what I now need to do is adjust. Okay. I got to go say, okay, well, hold on a minute. I have a new low bar, and I'm going to adjust to said bar. And in addition to that, I have another one. So I'm just going to adjust again, and that process goes on and on and on until it doesn't. Okay. So here we're going to count the low bar plus each bar which fails to surpass the low bar's low. That becomes bar number one. We then have bar number two, three. Finally, we have a bar that surpasses the previous bar and or uh, bar one or the low bar is what I refer to it. We have a bar that surpasses it, meaning it takes out the low. We do not count that bar. So in this particular consolidation, we have three bars. Another illustration, we have a down bar and we're just gonna count those. Let's move real fast. How about that? So in, in, in live trading or you know, real-time markets, we got to, we have to be able to move fast. If I'm trading a one minute chart, I mean, you know, I, I have one minute in each bar to make decisions, right? Or do I count this bar? Do I not? You know, and I know that sounds like, oh, well, you have a whole minute, you know, you don't need that much to, to think about counting a bar. You're probably right. You don't. <laughs> I mean, but uh, maybe it's just me. So sometimes when we're moving that fast, um, you know, I actually do one minute charts are they're fast and I commend people who can trade them because, uh, you know, the decision making process there is is just exponential. OK. All right. So we're going to move fast. We got a bar. We got to keep adjusting. We have another low bar. So we're going to go, OK, this is bar number one. We continued. So this is bar number one. We continued again and we're adjusted. This is bar number one until it isn't right. So we have bar number one continuing bar number two, three and ongoing until we surpass the low bar. So now inside of this consolidation, we have six bars, all right? Don't count that bar that surpasses the low bar. Sellers cause demand levels. I, uh, so by the way, I, I did this presentation only once before, uh, it was pretty recent. So I apologize if you were there, you know, whatnot. I don't wanna be um, you know, wasting your time or whatnot, but this is interesting to me. And when, <laughs> I'll tell you what's funny about it is when I was creating this slide, I said to myself, I said, this is ironic, right? Um, this is gonna probably turn some heads or, or create a little bit of confusion because by definition, demand is buyers, right? So, I mean, it goes without saying. Uh, so in this case, I'm, I'm kind of throwing a wrench in there, right? I'm saying sellers cause demand levels. Now, that is not to say that sellers cause buyers, right? I'm not saying that. I'm saying they cause levels, okay? So like footprints, if you will, not footprint chart, but footprints on any chart left, uh, which we can use for future information, okay? So price stops moving higher when sell orders are reached and cannot continue higher until 100% of the sell orders are consumed, 100%, okay? Price can't move higher if there's still one remaining order. So that's a very important distinction. All right, so here, price stops. It's not going to move higher anymore 
um, <clears throat> when the sell orders are reached, you know, of course, we touch them and the battle begins, right? So think about it like that. The battle has now begun. So the high bar in the level indicates where the sellers were reached. The consolidation followed by continuation confirms there were not enough sellers to reverse price and therefore prices direction uh, or, excuse me, was not enough to reverse prices direction and new demand accumulated. So, um, you know, what, what are we really saying here? So let's say that we've come up to, uh, you know, sellers, wherever they may be. We'll talk about this further in the presentation. We've hit some sellers, right? Suffice to say. And the only way, there's literally one way that we know that demand exceeds supply is to go through them, right? So that's great. I mean, that's kind of not hard to understand. We know that the buyers were stronger than the sellers and that, that's, that's great. But again, what the consolidation does is it leaves a footprint. So it's just, it's a pause and it says, hey, a little battle, you know, uh, took place here but it was not a long battle, right? So remember back to the, you know, counting the bars, the more bars, the weaker it is. So we need to see the pause because that gives us, uh, well, a lot of things really, it gives us areas to put our stops. It gives us in general, uh, the footprint that we're looking for to say, yep, indeed, um, if price is moving in favor and we don't get this footprint, let's say. So I cannot see where the sellers were hit, I cannot see where the demand, you know, paused and reaccumulated, if you will. Well, then I'm in trouble because I have to go all the way back to the origin of the previous move to reduce my risk, right? So this is all about risk mitigation. I'm trying to mitigate the risk to, you know, to be as minute as possible. All right. Very good. And there we have the departure. When I get that departure, again, it's like, you know, there's my light bulb or epiphany. And I go, okay, got it. There we go. So it can no longer be debated. The demand exceeds the supply for sure. And therefore, I know for a fact that 100% of the sell orders um, up to the point in which the departure stops, of course, all the sell orders have indeed been removed. All right. So again, uh, invert, buyers cause supply levels. Previously, we said sellers cause demand levels, right? Um, and, and this will make a, a, only a few more slides, but I think this will come together and make sense. So price stops moving lower when the buy orders are reached and cannot continue lower until 100% of the buy orders are consumed. Right? Here, we have to stop, right? We know that we've indeed reached demand and or you know, at minimum some small abundance of, uh, of buy orders. Okay, sorry, I keep looking over because I'm having to move my, uh, let me see if I can move this a little bit closer. There we go. All right, so we've reached the buyers, right? Okay, so the low bar in a level, let's back up for a second, low bar in the level indicates where the buyers were reached. We know that because we stopped, right? Remember, there's no way to stop unless we reach a buyer. It doesn't have to be a ton of buyers. We have to reach some buyers. Otherwise, it's just, so in, if you have a transaction, you're gonna have sell order. Let's say you have one sell order and there's somewhere floating out there, there's a buy order you're literally going to go from one to the other. Imagine somebody submits a, a market order, right? What happens inside of that? It instantly fills it, okay? So therefore, you end up with a spread. Um, you know, I'd say be careful uh, in the spot market on, with day trading, right? You end up with that spread, you can get in a lot of trouble. But that's how it functions. So therefore, if I have a, I'm trying to throw up, you know, so, uh, like a bracket or whatever, but if I have a sell order and then a buy order 50 points lower for all intents and purposes, that's where it's going to go. Okay. Now we know that's not the case. There are massive amounts of orders at almost every tick, especially in the index markets, which is predominantly what I trade, the S&P to be specific. So there's pretty much orders at every single tick, right? Um, but what if there wasn't? Okay. Again, we cannot go through a price value until we consume the orders. All right. Has to be that way. It's just the way that it is. So the low bar, it's where it says, hey, you know, hold up. We've reached them. There, we're there. We know where the buyers are. The consolidation followed by continuation confirms there were not enough buyers to reverse prices direction and new supply accumulated. Right. 
So now I have something that can play in my favor. Am I looking for supply? And I won't go into this too much, but as I'm always trying to do my best to help people, um, and myself included, right? I need all the help in the world. But uh, I'm, I'm always trying to think in that regard. So uh, am I looking for supply? That's the question. Look, today is a perfect example. Uh, was I looking for supply today? No. Actually, in the room, we earlier discussed that the buy orders appeared to be accumulating, and therefore we anticipated that you know price would likely move higher. Ironically, it, <laughs> it moved a lot. It moved a lot higher, and not only did it move higher, but we stopped it. Um, well, you'll see. You'll see when we get out to the charts. Okay. So here we go. Pause for just a second. Okay. So here we go. We're going to uh, get through these final slides and out we go. Uh, demand. We want to locate demand at resistance. Now, if you remember the previous slides about sellers causing demand and, and you know, vice versa. So think about how we know that. So we want to, we have to have something, right? We, in other words, in other words, in order for me to know that we have demand and know that you know we're going to um, likely hit some sellers, where is that going to happen? You know, that's always the question. Resistance. So we're going to look for demand to accumulate at or near previous resistance levels. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Resistance levels. Uh, sometimes people refer to them as um, supply levels. That's fine. It makes no difference to me. Ultimately, it's a level. I have my own definition of the difference, and they are different, but that's neither here nor there. Ultimately, if you know, you know what levels are, it's, it's perfectly fine. If you don't, that's fine, too. Just put the P of A zone suite on your chart, and they will be, uh, they will be denoted there for you, right? So, uh, But anyway, all joking aside, let's look at a resistance level, right? Um, in this particular case, supply is weakened after retesting the resistance level many times. So we have price coming up, it's going to revisit, but I, I do mean going up, right? Because remember, resistance is always above, uh, support is below. Same with supply and demand. Supply is above, demand is below. Here we have the resistance level, price is retesting it. So every time we do that, remember, supply is weakened uh, and or diminished, if you will. I always like to make, there's so many little tidbits and things can be picked apart, right? I find that to be very unfortunate that, that um, you know, human nature has a tendency to do that. But but ultimately it can be you know, picked apart. So let's define some things. Let's uh, try to touch on every point. This is not to say that there cannot be supply here, right? So resistance is resistance. To me, the, the difference being supply is what is there or, or was initially there. Resistance is what is continuously put there, right? So let's say that we retest this level, great. You know, maybe it's a supply level. Maybe we have tons of order flow from previous, you know, historical behavior or whatnot. That's great. And then we have this as uh, a supply level. Okay, we go up and test it. We remove, definitively remove some of the initial orders that were submitted there. But that doesn't mean that there cannot be new orders placed there. So I always like to make that distinction because when I hear people talk about supply and demand, I think it's, um, you know, it's it's a conversation. You know, people, maybe they want to debate it. I don't think it's worth debating. Um, all I would like to do is speak on the facts. Here are the facts. I believe that there, uh, you know, are absolutely orders that remain at these levels. And I, you know, I, mean, I know that to be true, right? But here's the thing. I've been asked the question, you know, a hundred times, how long does supply and demand exist? So I, I would look at it this way. And I would say, of course, it depends on the instrument, but I believe that support and resistance, <clears throat> I believe it becomes substantially relevant. The reason is, is because if you look at the futures markets, you expire, right? I mean, ultimately, they exp some of them expire monthly or quarterly. You know, let's talk about the S&P. So again, that's what I trade predominantly. So they expire quarterly. So it's not possible, you see, for supply to still exist from six months ago. That is not, uh, it's not possible, as I said, because their orders, uh, you know, they would be removed. Anyway, as the, the quarterly expiration or expiry takes place, those orders would either be canceled by the broker 
or if they have a, a position for all intents and purposes, that's bad news bears because the broker is going to close that. And I know that I've, I've had that happen to me before. <laughs> Un <laughs> uh -oh. Unintentionally, you know, I did that um, one time yeah, that I can remember. I've only done that one time, but in it, honestly, I, I'm going to just kind of put a little bit of sh uh, shame out there, but it wasn't that long ago. You know, it was probably, uh, it was probably like a year ago or something like that, maybe a little bit longer, but, but the point is, you know, I, I, it wasn't a big deal. It, it was, it worked out very well, but it does happen. Okay. So that's not possible. Um, so then when you're talking about equities, it can definitely be long lasting, but I still think that support and resistance has a substantial role to play, okay? So that's the difference between uh, between the two. Take it or leave it. Everyone has their own definition, but like I said, having a rule set, in my opinion, is very good because it keeps us sane, you know, over the long term, that is. Um, all right, so supply is weakened. We already talked about that. Uh, as the said supply weakens, the buyers may more easily accumulate and consume, keyword consume. So they can now more easily consume the remaining sellers, right? we talked about the accumulation. What's happening right here? Well, we went up, we hit the buyers, or excuse me, in this case, we hit the sellers. So I now start counting my bars. I know that if I go too far, meaning too many bars, it becomes weaker and weaker, ergo this level of potential demand, it's not, it's not gonna fit my rule set. So I would just leave that behind, keep on, you know, keeping on and look for the next one. But maybe it maybe it does. Maybe it meets my rule set, and uh, and we go on. By the way, all of this is definitively uh, covered in our course. So there's not like a random amount of bars. We're not guessing at this. It's all very specific. In this particular case, you can see that we have a departure which clearly exceeds the resistance level. Right. The reason that this occurred is because the resistance may have been from a long time ago. It could have been from the same day, and so on. It it really doesn't matter. But ultimately, we came up. We tagged it. Or, or touch the resistance, we began to build more demand than supply. And that is, that's all that I can know. I've had many conversations with many people. Um, I've been educated by all of you. You know, I mean, it's amazing what I've been taught just by having conversations with you all. So thank you for that. Um, you know, with this, it's very simple. Uh, when it comes to, you know, supply and demand, when we go through it, Factually speaking, there is no sell orders down there. And so furthermore, if I'm going to use that, I have to put my analysis to work and I have to say, am I looking for demand levels right now? If I, uh, I'm going to give you three words, you all know this, uh, based on real estate, location, 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 right? So based on that, if I am now looking, if I predetermined that day, for example, I said, you know what, today, based on the location, my analysis, et cetera. I need to look for demand. Now, there may be 57 supply levels, but that's not what I'm looking for today, right? Because the location says otherwise. So I'm going to base my, uh, my analysis on the location, and then I can move forward from there. So as I was jokingly uh, said, there may be 57 supply levels, but I'm going to use none of them. So if I, if I see this one demand level, imagine that, right? 57, <laughs> 57 supply levels, and yet we have one demand level, and I place one trade, okay? So that's how this works. There is no way to predict the outcome. We all know this. I'm not saying anything that we don't know, um, but it's worth notating, right? Of course, just because we have a demand level, then of course, it doesn't mean that it's going to work out. But as we know, nothing means that it's going to work out. There's no certainty in this game that we play, right? So instead of doing that, what we do is look for the next best thing. That is probability. If I know, number one, my analysis dictates that I'm looking for demand, right? In other words, I'm looking for price to go higher, but I just don't know where I want to do that from. Then I see a demand level. So not only do I know, all right, I want to go, you know, I want to try to buy the market. So maybe I'm buying low. So I want to try to buy the market here. And then I have an area of specificity, right? That's to say, I have accumulated buy orders right there in a very specific area. So I can reduce my risk and hope for the best, okay? Ultimately, that's, that's what we're doing on every trade, all right? So I want to locate supply at support, move a little bit faster because this is just inverted. So look for supply to accumulate at or near 
uh, previous support levels and backed it up there. I apologize if I'm moving too fast. Uh, demand is weakened after retesting the support level many times. So the same concept is applicable here. We go down, we touch the support level, we accumulate, right? And inside of that accumulation, the demand weakens and therefore it is much more easy to accumulate and or consume them, okay? We then depart, and right then I know. The epiphany goes off, right? And so I can say to myself now, I know, there it is. It's right in front of me. Um, although I don't know 100% if it's going to work out, I have layered probability in my favor. Location, 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 specificity, all right? I may call it a reduction of risk, if you will, but the level is the footprint. That's what tells me, hey, you know, keep an eye out right here because uh, we have, you know, uh, order flow left over here, most likely. How do you know that, Will? Because as we pointed out earlier, the fewer candles, the stronger it is. So if I have a lot of candles, I don't anticipate that at all. The exact opposite. I would say, no, we probably don't have any orders. Uh, I mean, any being, you know, uh, vague, but we probably don't have many orders remaining there. So if I go back to said supply level, we'll, we'll probably go through it, right? So I don't want to see that. I want to see few candles. I want to see an abrupt uh, departure and I want to exit, uh, uh, excuse me, execute through all of the opposing order flow. In this particular case, it's a supply level. So I want to knock out all of the demand, right? Okay. And we want to locate demand at resistance. We previously said that, but note the resistance is different here. So we're not talking about a resistance level. We're talking about resistance line. Um, and for time's sake, I'm just going to blow right through this. Okay. So we can get out to the live charts. Um, let's just put this into perspective. Think of the resistance level and the resistance line as two in the same, right? So ultimately resistance is resistance. It doesn't matter if it's coming from a, a trend line, um, Fibonacci ratio level. Uh, I mean, you know, there are a lot. Moving averages, uh, <laughs> overbought, oversold indicators, you know, we could go on and on. But ultimately we wanna focus on resistance in itself. And for what we're covering here, uh, we want to focus on two uh, two types of resistance, one being the level, two being the line, okay? So all of the, the concept is pretty much the same. It's going to weaken it, all right, the more we retest. So instead of the level, we're retesting a trend line or a resistance line. What's the difference, Will? Well, um, they're somewhat two in the same, but I think of resistance, support and resistance lines as, um, actually, let me back up for a moment. There is a defined uh in fact, it's actually built into our algorithms. There is a definitive difference, okay? But let me just give you a brief one. So I think resistance and support can be very, uh, we'll call it horizontal, but they can be very diagonal, could be horizontal, would be like the top of a range, bottom of a range, you know, something that's moving horizontal. Uh, conversely, it could be a trend line in itself. It could also be somewhere in between, right? So if you think about, um, I'm trying not to mess up the you know, background or whatever, but let's say you have a level, right? And then you have, uh, so horizontal, right? You have a level and then you have something here and then you have a you know, maybe a, a trend line, okay? So your trend line is here. What's that in the middle, right? So that is typically what I would refer to as support and resistance lines, okay? All right, so here we have that. And we're looking for that accumulation. We're looking for it to occur at the resistance line. We want to blow right through it, right? All right. Now I know. Pause. Now I have more information. I can put that to use. Okay. All right. And then we, of course, locate supply uh, at support, which is going to be the support line. Let's just move through this. Okay. We accumulate at said support line. We consume it and we move through it. Now I know that I have supply on my side. And if I'm in the correct location, i.e. Uh, larger picture, um, selling high, for example, right? We've been in an uptrend or moving higher for quite some time. Buy low, sell high. Okay. All right. So I'm going to introduce you to our PFA zone suite really quick before we get out to the charts. And um, on we go. So the PFA zone suite is fully compatible with NinjaTrader 8. It is indeed designed to reduce subjectivity and increase time efficiency by automatically drawing supply and demand zones on the price chart. I'm going to just stop right there because like, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, 
I, if I were to list the things that it actually does, I mean, let me let me just put it this way. It certainly wouldn't be possible on one slide, okay? Um, so in, instead of just sitting here and giving you a, a visual of some graphic that was created and all of that good fun stuff, let's, let's just actually look at some of the data points and then we'll see it on the chart, okay? It does have a multitude of data points, number one, and there are many, as I said, but we have primary levels. This is our terminology um, to refer to them, whatever you want, really. Uh, and I can give them a couple different names, but as notated um, in our software documentation and the software itself, right? So our nomenclature has to be very consistent, of course. So this is what we refer to as uh, primary levels, secondary levels. So uh, we have two different, two different levels. Think of these. I know that all of you are uh, very intuitive. So I'm just going to tell you these are multiple time frame levels, right? It's capable of uh, putting essentially any time frame on any chart, and not only just one, but two. I could have a 60 minute chart. And on that 60 minute chart, I could have daily supply and demand levels as well as four hour supply and, uh, and demand levels. So it doesn't have to be uh, neither of them. I mean, do they have to be the same as the as the chart period? OK, they can both be different. It could be the same if you want to. Uh, but again, there's no requirement. Right. So we have two of those and we we would want to be able to pull in multiple time frame. The benefit there is I don't have to go. I don't have to go to multiple time frames. I can do this all from one chart. Uh, meaning, if I my personality for all intents and purposes is to say, you know what, I love. I'm going to trade the daily and the 60 minute chart. I love uh, that combination. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, great. Well, instead of you know bouncing back and forth or putting up two charts, the conventional way, right? The the way that I have used to have to do it for many years. Instead of doing that, I just do it from one chart. I got all the information that I need right there. I was never really executing based on the larger picture anyway. Um, let me be careful how I, say, how I say that because that's exactly what I'm doing. I am entering based on the analysis of said larger time frame, but my executions are coming from the smaller time frame, right? So I want to be on the smaller time frame and pull my analysis onto that time frame. Okay. Give you an, uh, an example. I want to pull the daily levels onto my 60 minute chart. Okay. All right. Very good. So here we have, uh, we know that we now have multiple um, supply and demand levels, in, meaning multiple time frame levels that we can put on the same chart. We have altitude grid. This is a perceived value. Um, it's uh, referred to as many different things, but, you know, out, think about it this way the altitude grid helps us to determine if we're buying low or selling low, right? It's a buy low, um, you know, sell high grid, and it helps to give us the information, uh, in, you know, in relation to such. Okay. So if I, let me give you an example. If I'm buying, but I'm in, um, you can't really see it. It's kind of cut off in the image, but up here in the top right, if you can see there's red, right? So it goes from your red to orange to like a dark green. And then to, I think it says lime green or bright green or what have you. But suffice to say, if I am up here in the red, or even the orange for that matter, if I'm hitting the buy button, I am definitively not buying low. I can't be because I've been moving up. That's the only way I get into those areas. So that kind of helps to uh, just keep that simple concept. We have continuations. Very, very, very useful. Very important. Have a lot to do with what we've talked about today. Okay, so you're going to see these. If you notice over here, uh, you can see what we call an RBR and then the DVD, common terminology, acronyms, if you will. And uh, they're basically continuation patterns. All right. So those are going, those are automated, of course. They're built into our software. And we're going to use those uh, for basically everything we've discussed today. Next, we have automatic trend lines. I mentioned to you before that we have, uh, or we have differentiated uh, support and resistance lines from trend lines. So in our code, there is actually a selectable option that you can define whether it's a trend line and or just a uh, support and resistance line, okay? So those are automated as well. That was very difficult, by the way, <laughs> very difficult. I mean, uh, silly almost, but that was one of the more, you know, challenging things that we've done. And it seems like it would be the easiest, but I, I assure you it is not. Um, volume profile is built in uh, to our zone. So the zones in themselves are offering specificity, right? So it's reduced. It's a reduction of risk. It says, hey, this is, you know, this is the, the pungency 
uh, of where the order flow took place and so on. And then we can go a step further. So the idea behind the profile inside of the zones is to offer even more specificity. Now I can go into the area where the majority and or the pungency of the order flow took place, and I can even get more granular and say, okay, what happened inside of that area? So I see the area, now I need to dive into it, right? It's like a pool, um, but you know, I can see the deep end, but if I dive in with goggles, like I, you know, I, I can see everything down on the bottom. I just gotta swim down there and see it. Um, so that's what the volume profile is meant to do. Uh, we of course have market structure. We have a unique way of doing that. It's uh, you know defined, of course, uh, in our algorithms. Market structure is you know it's not rocket science, but I mean ultimately it's a version of swings, and we add in certain criteria, um, you know, to define it. But I mean ultimately it you know that's that's basically what it is. It's defining the swings in the market, and that allows us to connect the dots, right? So market structure allows us to say you know who's in control. Um, have the buyers continuously exceeded the sellers, which defines an uptrend or vice versa uh, and things to that. So many benefits to it. You'd be surprised when it comes to automation, what you can achieve with that. All right. So the next thing, and I believe this is the final um, or not the final slide, but I think there is maybe one more after this um, uh, besides maybe the discount codes or something. Uh, but this I'm in love with. Okay. So I know that sounds weird. I don't mean <laughs> maybe be too silly about it, but but I absolutely, I mean, this just makes my job so much easier on a daily basis. The way that we've built uh, our ability to handle orders directly from the chart um, is, you know, it, it's amazing to me because like I said, it's, you know, it's all built around efficiency and what I need to achieve. Okay, so yes, you're thinking, well, there's the chart trader and Ninja Trader, right? They have, of course, they, and it's wonderful. Um, but there are so many little things that I would like to do in a microsecond that's maybe not already there, such as uh, values. You know, I need to see the values. What's my risk and reward in ticks and currency? Um, you know, what's the exact value? We have a lot of information on our labels, but that's not the, you know, that's not the important thing about it. It's the ability to, you know, submit orders and to move them, uh, manipulate them. We can submit orders to literally to different markets from the corresponding market. So in this particular instance, I might be on the S&P. Based on that, I might want to hedge against it, right? So I could submit an order here. Uh, and if you notice up here, I, I hope you can see my mouse, but there's a little plus sign. And then just beside that, there's like an up and down arrow, okay? Well, the plus sign is what we refer to as our primary order management. That means that um, basically just think of it as, as one, right? Okay, so that's one. And then the next one over to the right, that's going to be our secondary order management menu. In those drop down menus, we'll see a moment uh, in a moment that there are multiple you know, entry types and so on. But we can actually submit orders, let's say from our primary menu to the corresponding market in this um, in this example, I've referred to the S&P, but let's say that, you know, for whatever reason, I want to hedge that, and I, you know, I would not do this, but I'm just kind of throwing it out there on my head. Maybe I want to hedge it with the NASDAQ or something. I, I don't know. So from the secondary menu, I can set that to submit orders on the trigger lines from the S&P, but when they're met, submit the order on the NASDAQ, right? I mean, again, horrible, maybe example, but it is an example. We could pick any two markets. It does not matter. Um, you know, and, and we can use it as such. All right. So we just simply have to you know, click the mouse. All right. And finally, this is the, the menu that I was referring to moments ago. You can see there are multiple order types there, uh, just different things that we can use to create that ongoing efficiency. Okay. All right. Very good. So today you've seen the presentation. We addressed the zone suite. I am going to, as a matter of fact, let me back this up. For, give me just one second, guys and gals. Uh, hey, Key, maybe I can do it. You know what? I probably do it myself. Um, I was just going to try to paste a link in there real quick, but yeah, I can do it. I'm just going to put it into the chat and voila, there we go. So there's the link that you're seeing on the screen. We're going to do that follow up uh, session on Monday at 10 a.m., and that's the 12th of September. 
and I'll be happy to see you there. But you need to get signed up for that, otherwise you won't get the invitation email, okay? All right, very good. So it's in the chat. I, I Hopefully you can you can grab that there. We're going to keep going. Um, I will give you the discount codes real quick before we get out to the live charts. If you, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I'm not here to push sales on people. We want you to be happy, okay? And um, so we're not going to, you know, spend too much time on this or whatnot. Suffice to say, this is only the second time. The only reason I'm offering it today is, number one, because, you know, being with Shark Indicators, we always try to, you know, try to take it up a notch, right? Uh, but uh, th this has only been offered, you know, twice. And if you are in the market for our software or our community, et cetera, um, you know, now would be the time, okay? Because this, this won't be offered, um, again, at least not for some extended period of time. All right. So you see what's here. You can, um, I'm sure you're going to see it on the recording. Again, I'm not trying to push a sale on you. If you want it, we'd love for you to have it. I personally believe, I mean, if it, you know, to me, this, as I said, I've become self-reliant on this thing. Um, you know, it's it's really advantageous you know, for me as far as efficiency, and I just don't want to trade without it ever. Um, but in this particular case, you can get it. Uh, what would initially cost you $19.96? That's for two different things, by the way. Uh, if you want to just get the PFA Zone Suite along, alone, it's $14.97. Contact us. We'll get you a discount on that, too. Uh, but if you want the hedger, the hedger is that secondary uh, menu, right? The ability to submit orders to secondary markets and so on. Uh, so those combined are typically $19.96, and today they're only $13.97. That will go on for 48 hours, okay? All right. And then the uh, we have two other offerings that you're welcome to take part in. Again, if you're going to, like if you're in the market or whatnot, now would be the time uh, to go ahead and kind of jump at it. Um, we'd love to have you. But here you can get one year of the PFA community. You can see the offerings there. That comes with our community room, which is basically uh, our live room Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of each week, excluding holidays. You get a license to the PFA Zone suite. You get uh, member access, you know, form. Session recordings, for example, each and every day we record the session. You can go back and review, et cetera. We have a very extensive uh, you know, trading course. It typically takes, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there, there's no defined you know, exact amount of time, but I would say generally from the feedback, it takes people uh, 30 plus hours to complete it. But I don't want you to think you're going to be bored to death, right? It's video format, and then there are reviews, um, and they're multiple choice, but we de designed it in a way for retention purposes so that it doesn't bore you to death. And then, of course, example trade plans are included in that, et cetera. And you can get that, what's normally $19.99 for $15.99. And then you can get lifetime access plus the hedger, um, which I don't know why that's only $49.99. It should be, I believe, $54.98 or something, uh, but that's okay. Suffice to say, you can get all of it for $39.99.20, okay? And then our, our final offering here is if you want to get involved with both uh, Shark Indicators and PFA simultaneously, uh, Maybe you want to, to look at Bloodhound in, in a combination with the PFA Zone Suite. I would strongly encourage that, by the way. So you can essentially take Bloodhound and automate your signals based on the PFA Zone Suite. So I could throw out a, a buy or sell signal or what have you based on all the different conditions that the PFA Zone Suite offers. And as you saw earlier, there's a multitude of data points that can be used, and we only touched on a few of them. Um, so you can do a year of the community plus Bloodhound. Uh, for 2235, 20 that is, and then you could do the lifetime community with a Bloodhound Ultimate package for 465520. Okay. All righty. Very good. And this is just, uh, we'll just kind of skip through this. This is the course what I was referring to, but let's do this, folks. Let's get out to the live charts really quick. And I'm going to spend like five minutes, you know, maybe uh, try to do this really quick. Let me kind of escape myself from that. There we go. All right. Oh, here we go, folks. Good timing. All right, so what I see right here uh, is real time, by the way. Obviously, you know that. Give me just one second here. <clears throat> Got to keep the hydration going, you know? So <clears throat> uh, earlier I spoke to you in regards to the irony, right, of the markets. It's quite astonishing, really, at how the markets continue to function, all right? So they're always gravitating to and from supply and demand. As we said, supply is going to form, you know, most often at support. <clears throat> Conversely, uh, 
demand is going to form resistance and so on and so forth. We know that because that's the only way to get through them. So it's not that supply and demand can't form at other locations. It's that we don't know about it, right? I mean, there's no way to know about it. You remember, you, we need the footprint on the chart. But if I can get ahead, like we were talking about before, and mind you, when I say things like that, I think it's very important to point out that there is no ego involved in what I am saying. It is a matter of fact, right? Um, so, and again, to point out, we are not always right. In fact, you know, definitely not always right. And we talk about that acceptance, you know, making sure that we understand kind of going into it, we're going to get this wrong frequently. It's not about that. It's about having a strategy to be right um, as much as we can. And when we're right, to be much more right than when we're wrong. In other words, to put our reward much greater than our risk. Okay. So what I got excited about when I looked at this chart, um, <clears throat> I wanted to tell you about the irony. Okay. So this morning we come in and you all know, I mean, you, you can see what we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, right? Just basically going straight down. I mean, it's, it's been, it's been pretty rough. It's been pretty rough. And we've talked about this literally since 2020, early 2020, in fact. Um, you know, we said this was coming and I think probably many of you said that too, um, or knew it or felt it or what have you. Right. So this is, it's okay. It's all good. It, it's what it is. And in fact, you know, there, from time to time, we're all going to go in cycles and we have to do this, but it doesn't mean that we're going to go in one direction forever. Okay. So what's happening here, you can see this particular supply level, 39, 98, 40, 72, three quarter. We've recently hit it. And in fact, we had uh, a sell position. So let me just point out the ones oh, in this entire move down. Okay. We sold the market here. We sold the market here. And we sold, I'm sorry. No, so it was four. So we sold the market right here. We sold the market right here, here, and here. Okay. Now, today we stated, hold the phone. Hold on a minute. Because if we back this up, we bought the market right there. Okay. That is where it was indicative to us that the buyers were likely to exceed the sellers. Of course they did. There was no way for, we didn't know this was going to happen. You know, just like we never know the outcome of it, of, you know, every trade, but ultimately, you know, we, the chart was telling us that price wanted to go higher. Okay, great. So it did. Of course, then we're shorting the market, but look at where we've, um, you know, where we've reverted to. So today we're back at this particular area. We're making lower lows and so on and so forth. Pattern begins to emerge. So this morning we say, hold on a minute. No, no, no. Uh, you know, we, we are actually looking at potential demand. We were looking at a specific pattern. We saw the resistance, we saw demand accumulating and so on and so forth. And then, I mean, again, there's no way for us to have predicted what happened today, but lo and behold, it did happen. So it was quite nice. Um, but here's the irony. This is what I wanted to tell you. Okay. Look at where price stopped. This is not coincidental, right? It, it happens all the time, all the time. Remember earlier, I was telling you that I had that conversation earlier today. It happened multiple times during that conversation. We were looking, but it was on a three-minute chart. This exact same thing occurred on the three-minute chart. It went up, it tagged our supply level, and lo and behold, it dropped right away from it, right? So we're, we're watching this in real time, um, which is intriguing. But now we're looking at it at a much bigger time frame. That's to say the four-hour chart. So the irony here is that I just want to point out when demand exceeds supply, there is always the gravitational pull. We're going, if we're if demand is exceeding supply, we're simply going to find the next area of supply. Conversely, you know, we if supply exceeds demand, we're going to find the next area of demand and the ongoing battles continue, okay? So if you think about that, no pun intended, I don't like using the, the terminology, but I feel somewhat that I have to because um, anyway, so that being said, it, it's, battles taking place. And I think of the overall trend as like the war, you know what I mean? So there's, there's battles like pullbacks and continuations and so this inside of the trend, but the trend in itself is, is ultimately the war. Okay. 
So we want to we want to win every battle that we can, but we know that we're going to lose some of them. But overall, we want to take you know we want to we want to take the the war. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. So in this case, um, the the irony is we rallied all day. So this was from this morning, right? Or excuse me. Yeah. So the, you know, so I don't forget exactly where we started our session. Let me open up. I can tell you. I said I could. Okay, there we go. So, yeah, we started it on this candle, you know, right here. All right. Started on towards the beginning of that, I believe. Yeah, because we, I know it was because we were still dropping, <clears throat> but that's okay. So, anyway, we started here. Um, and how was one to know that we, you know, we were going to conclude there, right? We didn't predict it, but the irony is, it's the same as always. You know, we we start at one point and we go find the next. Okay, so this is how the software works. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, given the time and the limited time now that I have, right? Thank you, Keith and and everyone for your time. Um, but I'm going to kind of rush through the rest of it because I actually have an appointment that I have to uh, to get to. And so uh, remember Monday. Make sure you look through the chat. Get your uh, get your registration done there. Uh, we will answer any and all questions that you have. It's been as, as much time as we need. It doesn't really matter however much, and we'll, we'll go over. But it, during that session, you'll be able to see us, you know, we'll, we'll be submitting, if, if there, you know, if the scenarios are presented, of course, we will be submitting trades and, and uh, just kind of have some fun with it, right? We'll put all of this into action and uh, we'll, we'll uh, kind of enjoy our time together, okay? So any quick questions? Um, yeah, absolutely, I can. Uh, hopefully, oh, I'm sorry, guys and gals. Yeah, I, I think I had it submitted to only the hosts or something like that. There you go. So it should be in the uh, in the chat now. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. And if you will, just real quick, I got like four minutes, if or, or you know tops. But if you have any questions, do let me know really fast. Um, what you learned today or looked at, excuse me, let me turn these off. Well, I'll worry about that in a little bit. What you're looking at today, um, remember what I what I stated earlier about the software is doing the work, right? So here, so you're just basically looking at all this, um, and these are our um, these are our supply and demand patterns. So what we do is we look at them in advance. So we want to find it before it happens, not after, of course. And then if it's uh, after the fact we can use them for retest purposes. So we're going to we're going to go as far in advance as we can and we're going to predetermine where the high quality supply and demand should uh, reside and that's going to be based on our very simple questions that we asked previously, right? How many bars are inside the consolidation? How's the departure so on? That's going to help us to determine the quality of the level after it's formed. But where the level is forming helps us to determine if it should turn out to be a supplier demand level in itself. All right, hopefully that helps. Um, what's the discount code? Um, if I just want to zone and not the hedger. Do, I will make it the same. Um, do me a favor, shoot an email. Um, I think it's to two different people. MJ, um, the cost, could you tell me uh, specifically for what you're looking at? But I'll tell you what, do me this. Do me a solid if you, if you will. Todd and MJ, shoot me an email. Or, uh, you can send it directly to myself or here, just. There you go, guys and gals. So if you'll send an email um, with your questions regarding cost or uh, the discount code, et cetera, uh, just shoot an email over and say, hey, this is what I was asking about. I'll absolutely get that back to you. It might be later tonight, if you don't mind. I do, like I said, I have a jump. <laughs> I have an appointment that I have to jump to and you know how time goes, guys and gals, but I will do that. I'll get it right back to you no later than tonight. Um, I will have to uh, I will have to create the discount code. It'll be the same, Shark Indicators, but I will have to create that disc code or have it created uh, for you guys as we didn't create one specifically for the PFA Zone Suite without the hedger, but I am happy to do that. It's no problem. Um, and if there are any other questions, uh, tell you what, I don't see them coming in immediately. But if you have any, please, uh, look, I'm happy to help. I mean, you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't, I don't know, but I will, I promise that I will try. That's what I can promise you, okay? Um, I will certainly do my best. 
I want to say thank you to you all, as always. I really appreciate it. I know that today, like when we're going through this information, it may seem overwhelming or like, you know, right now you may not conceptualize the benefit in it. Review the recording, if you will. Um, try to think on a logical basis. What is it that I'm really trying to provide to you? And uh, I think you'll come to find that it's a lot more impactful um, than you initially may, may think, okay? Um, but if it's not, well, then let me know and I'll make sure that, you know, we're able to get you into, um, you know, our free sessions or whatever, because I want you to see how impactful that it can actually be. Um, so anyway, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Keith, all the guys and gals at uh, Shark Indicators, really appreciate your time. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, my friend, and God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Very cool, Will. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys uh, asking lots of questions for them. And uh, yeah, we're, we're always really happy to have you here because you always have some some new uh, topic to talk about. So um, MJ, there is a recording available. Um, it will actually be sent out by Zoom uh, in about 24 hours. So you may be able to find it on our YouTube channel before then, but just watch for that email tomorrow and check your spam folder. So uh, if that's it, Will, I know you got to go. So I'll let you go. You guys have a great day. Thanks a lot.